Well, all right, guys, uh, let's kick things off. Uh, first of all, welcome. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, we are here to celebrate the launch of my mom's book. Uh, this is something that I really started as a, as a project about, I want to say, nine years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, and it started as the 30 Days, 30 Deeds blog. I'm sure many of you know it uh, and have read it. Uh, but it was really aimed at, at uh, helping me and my sister uh, get instilled a sense of values, principles, and, and culture. And uh, I never thought it would manifest itself in, in this beautiful book that we have here today. Uh, and mom, the, there's not much I can say other than I am I'm proud of you, I'm inspired by you, I love you. Uh, what you've accomplished is incredible. Um, and yeah, with, with, without further ado, it is to my pleasure to introduce my mom, my friend, my mentor, my teacher, Selma, the lean, not so mean, kindness giving machine, Ali. <laughs> mom, you have the floor. Love you. Thank you, Vita. Thank you. That's my time, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, sweetheart. That was, that was everything. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It means so much to me that you're here. I wish I could see you and I wish we could do this in person, but uh, at least this way, uh, I know a lot of people from around the world uh, have been able to join family members and well-wishers. So I'm really, really grateful that you're all here. Um, and soon we'll, we'll talk about this, this book. It's um, 30 Days, Stories of Gratitude, Traditions, and Wisdom. And it's a collection of personal stories. But before we start the discussion on that, the making of this book is in fact a story in itself. And to give you an idea of, of that, I'd like to share a video. It's just two minutes long and it'll give you a sense of what went behind uh, the making of this book. Um, it involved an extraordinary artist from Afghanistan, Sohra Husseini. It involved an amazing hardworking team uh, that did the layout and the production and the hand binding of each book, uh, Drick, led by Shahid al-Alam and Reza Rahman in Bangladesh. And so this really, it's been a labor of love, the writing of it, the, the art behind it, the producing of it. So to give you an idea of, um, of that, I'd like to share this video produced by Drick. It's our personal stories that connect us that make us feel more at home with each other. This book is a collection of stories. A grandson's letter of gratitude to his nenno. A mother's loving prayer for her children. A daughter remembering her father's wisdom. A friend sharing his despair at this difficult time. A recipe that brings back memories of laughter and love. The making of this book is itself a story of the Afghan artist whose foreign success endangered her life at home. Yet she continues to create with paints made of crushed gemstones, lapis lazuli and emeralds, and with rose petals and tea. Of a production team of storytellers in Taka, committed to promoting social justice. Of the artisans binding each book by hand with care and attention. Just a few hundred, a collector's edition. All these layers of stories are stitched together, but there remains space for one more. Yours. What are you grateful for? What traditions hold special meaning for your family? What wisdoms guide your life? Whose story inspires you? Let's share our stories and 
reconnect. Thank you. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that video. I, I think they did such a beautiful job. Um, I, it is such a pleasure for me to introduce all of you to my dear, dear friend, Claire Shipman. She is an extraordinary journalist. She is an amazing interviewer and she is really uh, the best friend you can have. So thank you, Claire, for being here. Thank you for sharing this special moment with me, with all of us. It means so much. Thank you, Soma. Thank you for asking me to do this. And this book, it is like a jewel. It is so beautiful. And that video, I don't, we, it's going to be hard for us to compete with that because the video is fantastic, Soma, but thank you. Uh, my dear, dear friend, I'm so proud of you. And thank you for sharing this with all of us. I, I think it would be wonderful. Many people may know this already um, uh, uh, in this webinar, but can you talk a little bit, because I was surprised by a lot of the details. The, you know, Zaid mentioned this project started 10 years ago. I mean, how did you get the idea for this 30 days project? And, you know, let us know about the essence of it and what you were trying to achieve. Okay, so as, as you know, this uh, week we started um, the month of Ramadan. And the month of Ramadan is uh, the time that Muslims fast from dawn until sunset. But it's also a time when we really try and be our best selves, uh, express gratitude, do kind deeds, uh, care for each other. There is so much to this month in addition to fasting. And 10 years ago, when the kids were young, Zaid was nine at the time, uh, our daughter Sanya, they weren't fasting during the month, throughout the month of Ramadan, but I wanted them to understand the essence of the month. So Ramadan 2011, we decided we would do one good deed each day. Nothing earth changing or world saving, just small things that we could do for our family, uh, for our neighbors within our community, really to understand that there are simple and small ways to make someone's life a little bit easier, even just to put a smile on someone's face. There's a, a saying actually in our faith tradition that making your brother smile is a form of charity. And so I wanted, I wanted the kids to understand those values and to keep us sort of accountable that we would do something each day. We thought we would start a blog. We would just write a few sentences share it with our family, with our extended family, with our neighbors, with our community, um, and just make that sort of a, a habit for those 30 days. And so that first year, we baked moon and star shaped cookies for friends. We hosted a neighborhood iftar. Um, we planted some trees. And some days the kids just spent time with my parents who were visiting, uh, listening to their stories and doing experiments and making them smile. So that's, that's how it started, uh, 30 days, 30 deeds. Then the next Ramadan, we thought, let's continue this and focus on another important aspect of Ramadan, which is gratitude, expressing gratitude. So that year, uh, each one of us would share something that we were grateful for, small things, big things, everyday things. Uh, it ranged from our, our dog, Luna, to Babushka's jam tarts, to a Downton, um, Downton Abbey Marathon. So simple things that came to mind. And again, we would jot it down in the blog and send it out there for whoever was reading. Uh, and it continued. So for the following years, it was 30 traditions, 30 recipes, 30 inspiring stories. My most favorite year was 30 wisdoms from our elders. And slowly and organically, the blog sort of found an audience, friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor. Uh, people would share it on social media, by email. And somehow it, it just grew. 
very organically. Not to say that it's gone viral, it hasn't. It's not read by millions of people, but it is read all over the world from Australia to Zambia and countries in between. And it's read by non-Muslims as well. And that's something that I found so um, beautiful and, and really fulfilling that non-Muslims write to me now and say, we don't celebrate Ramadan, but we do look forward to the month because we know that we'll be uh, reading these stories for 30 days. And I think it just speaks to the power of personal stories, to be honest. Well, how, so that's what I, I is so beautiful about this project is right in your in the blog in this 10 years, right? You're you focused on the lessons of Ramadan, which in, in themselves, of course, are powerful, whether it's good deeds or gratitude or wisdom of the elders or even recipes, right? So they're all things that I think make people feel happy, better connected. But then you really, I guess, had a revelation at a certain point that in addition to all of that, it was about the storytelling. And it was really about not just, you know, writing down two words, well, here was my good deed in two words, that there was, <laughs> there was something about telling a little story around what you did that allowed people to be pulled in and connect. So can you talk a little bit about that, you know, that, I guess, inspiration for you around storytelling? Absolutely. So, you know, these posts um, are, are ordinary stories. They're not anything major or extraordinary. Um, and I think that that really is the appeal. It is our everyday ordinary stories that connect us. And what I realized is that while this blog takes place during the month of Ramadan, and while the central characters happen to be Muslim, the things that it talks about, the values that it, uh, that it discusses are universal. We all share those values. And it's by reading stories around these things that we all have in common that we can connect with each other. You know, stories help us uh, become familiar with each other, start a friendship, develop trust. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what faith tradition we belong to, what country or culture we come from, what political persuasion we may have. It's our stories, our ordinary, human, personal, messy, genuine stories that connect us above all. And if I may, I'll share one example that's- Please, I know I have some of my favorite, I wanted to ask you about a few, but share, share yours. Well, it's, uh, it, it's an example that um, I include in this book and it's, it just speaks to how powerful uh, a story can be. You know, a few years ago, I wrote the story of a day in the life of our family during Ramadan. And I wrote it for a national women's magazine. Again, a very simple story, what, what it was like waking up, what we did during the day, what we ate to break our fast. I didn't think anything of it until a few weeks after it was published, I received uh, a message on Facebook and a woman who had read that story, she wrote to me and she said, please accept my intrusion on your privacy. But I, but I read about you online and I read your article I'm a Catholic woman with a 19 year old daughter who told me two weeks ago that she's in the process of converting to become a Muslim. With that sentence, I will tell you that I'm afraid, concerned, confused, cautious, curious, and searching for answers. It was amazing to me to receive this message and she went on to say that I don't know anything about Islam. All I actually know is what I've seen in the media and most of it has been negative and I'm scared. And I read your piece, it gave me a little sense of hope and she took the chance to reach out and sort of find me uh, on, on, through social media and, and write to me. And so we started this journey together. It was an online uh, virtual journey. I sent her some people that she could speak to, some books, some resources to help her during this very difficult, confusing time. And it continued for years. You know, her daughter did convert to Islam. She started wearing the hijab. She met a Muslim man. She, they traveled to Turkey where she got married. And through this process, uh, Annette, and I'm sure Annette is, is, is watching, 
uh, she would write to me and we would just sort of hold each other's hands virtually. Uh, we hadn't met until very recently, about a year or so ago, when she drove from New Jersey for the day to Washington, D.C. to participate in a Kind Works uh, cooking project. So we finally got to meet uh, Annette and her daughter. But I think this story really captures what a story can do. I mean, I had no idea that this ordinary story would, would have this impact, not just on Annette and her family, but on, on all the people that she is now sharing the story with. You know, she has learned about Islam through these experiences, and she shares this with her church group and with the media, and I, I've shared this story as I'm doing now, and so the, the ripple effect is amazing. And I think we just need to be aware that what we think is our ordinary story can have a tremendous, extraordinary impact on the lives of someone else. Well, and even I imagine for, um, you know, maybe for people who don't have a blog with your reach, right? Or you're, you know, you're not, they're not reaching out in the same way, but talk a little bit about just storytelling and the importance of that for our families and how, you know, taking the time, I think, first of all, in our culture today, right? Storytelling takes time. So there's a, you know, and sometimes I think when I listen to you, I think, can I get my kids to sit still and actually listen for that long? And, you know, it's a bit, but, but they like, I mean, beyond just, you know, getting a lecture and a schedule and whatever from their parents, there's something that pulls Yes, kids in and helps them learn when you're talking about family stories, your own stories. So can, can you talk a little bit about this? Absolutely. I will share a, a very personal example. You know, my, my father uh, was the ultimate storyteller. Uh, he would tell the most amazing stories about growing up in Calcutta, about traveling to, to London to, to study in college. The stories were filled with so much detail, with so much passion, with so much nuance. It felt like you were there with him. And he told it with such gusto. And he'd repeat the same story many times. And we'd listen each time with the same enthusiasm because it was palpable, his, his passion for what he was sharing. And so, you know, by hearing those stories over and over again, they've become part of our families sort of muscle memory, you know, I, I can share those stories now with my kids. And I think it is so valuable because to be honest, our story is all that we really have. You know, it's the, the one thing that is truly ours. And I can't think of anything more important than preserving that, capturing that, sharing that. I mean, each one of us is mortal, but our stories are gonna live on. So the importance of capturing and sharing within your family, whatever stories there are. And, you know, one thing, Claire, we were talking about this yesterday. You don't have to have this extraordinary story of being a refugee and escaping here or something dramatic or exciting. It is truly our everyday ordinary stories that are the most meaningful because they're the most meaningful for us and for our kids and for our parents. It's what we share with each other. It's the, it's how we build our bonds. And it's those stories that we need to capture. And I like that in because you said that to me and in looking through the book, I realized there's also a sense of, in a lot of these stories, they are very um, relatable, right? I, there was one from Arif that starts with, Salma is mad at me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or, you know, called chasing watermelon or you want about your dad, my father loved dessert, right? And so yes. this focus, I think on even the mundane, right? And making that something small, so interesting. And that's, that is an art. How do you, you have a storytelling business now, which I think is incredible. And there is so much research on the fact that we all learn best through stories, right? We're not only captivated by them, but they're just an incredible teaching tool, right? They change our hormones, they, you know, they make us happier. When you have clients who say, wait, I don't have a story or how is my life a story or what do I do, how do I do this? I mean, how do you start mm -hmm. helping people understand what their story might be and how to actually do this? Yes, so I think the first 
thing is to get over this hurdle that I don't have a story. We all, we, each of us has a story. We have multiple stories. We have so many stories are what make us who we are. So I think first, just getting over that block uh, of thinking, well, I haven't done anything interesting or you know, my life isn't all that exciting. I don't have any stories to share. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And whatever those stories are, uh, it could be you know, a, a love story or uh, a wisdom that you cherish or a moment that somehow changed you, however small it might be. Just start by recollecting that. Um, so that's one thing. And the second would be, I think just if you want to start in your family, just start by sharing stories out loud, say them out loud, whether it's at the dinner table or, or just in the car as you're driving, just start a conversation with a story. Remember the time when, and let the kids chime in and, and let your parents chime in, whoever happens to be there to fill in some of the details and, uh, and the nuances and, and, and get the emotions from everybody and, and just start that practice of, of telling stories as a family. It's so much fun. Um, and then, you, you know, perhaps as I did with the book, uh, you know, I had no idea. We just started this as a blog, a simple, small family project. I didn't know it would last 10 years. I certainly didn't think it would turn out uh, into a book and that I'd be sharing it with all of you tonight. So just start small. It doesn't need to be a book. It doesn't need to even be shared by anyone outside of your family. But just, just jot down a few things. One thing that we did, for example, day one of lockdown last year, I took um, a bowl that was in the kitchen and we, I cut up some strips of paper and I asked the kids and RF, uh, we each would write three things that we were grateful for. That's it. Not long sentences, not big stories, just three words of gratitude. Uh, whatever it was, a meal or a walk or a TV show. And, and we tossed it into this bowl. And now it's a year later and there are all these folded up pieces of paper. And I was looking through it the other day. It is a story. It is a story of blessings during the hardest time in our lives as a family. So, you know, that's how you can start just by simple things, but just being conscious of the fact that you're, you're, you're doing that. Well, and, I'll just, and the way you've organized the book too, right? That's a great idea for yes. a start because the sort of wisdom from your elders, recipes, gratitude, sometimes it helps to have a yes. story. And I thought, you know, there was a great story in here we were talking about the other day from Zaid where he, it was in the wisdoms from our elders where he, he had listened so much to Arif talking about something that then that became his story when he was asked about that. That's right. Um, yes, perhaps I'll, I'll read a, a little bit. Is that okay? Or, yeah, I think that would be nice. Okay, so this was the year where we did Wisdoms from Our Elders and I asked, um, I, I was able to share, um, my father had just passed away just a few weeks before this Ramadan started. And it was a chance for me to, sh to record the wisdoms that I've learned from him that I've learned from my mom and I asked my kids as well. And Zaid, um, you know, he hemmed and hawed for a long time. I kept asking him, I kept asking him. He's like, mom, no, whatever. One day we were in the car running errands. I'm like, okay, now I've got him in the car. There is no way he can leave for the next 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I asked him to share, you know, what is it that comes to mind uh, as he thinks about a wisdom from an elder, whether it's a parent or a coach or a teacher and so this piece starts, Zayd and I were running errands, just the two of us in the car and no possible escape. So I took the chance to ask him what wisdom from an elder he keeps close to mind. After a bit of fussing and oh, momming, he told me it's something his father says to him. Pa always says, the most important thing you have is your character and integrity. No one can take that away from you. That's who you are. It's what makes you, you. Without that personal core, you don't really have a home base for yourself. Every decision you make needs to be guided by that overarching thought. He continued, the right thing to do is not necessarily something that comes naturally. 
It's something you have to work on. Sometimes it's far easier to tell a lie than to be honest. You have to engineer being honest because that's the right thing to do. Pa said to think of it like creating your personal brand. Every decision adds or takes away from that personal brand. You wanna make sure that everything you do ensures that you have a personal brand that people respect and value. I asked Zaid when his dad told him this. Whenever I get into trouble, he said, it's usually for doing something stupid and Pa always brings up integrity and character and reputation. Is it sticking? I asked him. I think so, he said. <laughs> so, you know, a simple story captured on a car ride and, and just recorded in, in, a, in a few words, you know, nothing, um, the writing is simple and the idea is simple, but you know, this was a couple of years ago. He's, it's just a memory now of that moment, that sort of confused teenage high school time, you know? And I'll just share one other thing, Claire, I, I, about how important this is and why it's important to start today, right now. You know, as I said, my dad was this uh, amazing storyteller. And so as we were doing this blog, many of the stories involve him uh, and his stories. Um, and he even wrote one. He wrote one that's called Khudafiz Bapu, which means goodbye father. And he talks about the moment. He remembers the time and the day that he said goodbye to his father when he was in Calcutta leaving on a boat to come to London. It was a particular date at a 6.30 p.m. I mean, his memory was phenomenal. Uh, and then I was able to share his story on his 80th birthday because that year the theme was inspiring stories. And, and then I shared the wisdom after he passed away. And amazingly, as I was putting this book together and going through all the various stories, I realized he was the thread through, through it all. Each year there was some story that involved him or that he, he wrote um, and as I was going through the comments that people would share on the blog, I found two that I hadn't seen before. They were from 2013 and they were from my father. I could not believe it because I don't remember reading them before. My, my father has, has since passed. And those two comments, first of all, the fact that he was following my blog was amazing. It made me feel so good. The fact that he could figure out how to do the comments was really cool. And the fact that I found these stories now when I am missing him so much, and those two comments were addressed to Sanya and to Zayn. And they were about how he is, he loves them, he's cheering them on, he knows that they will do good things in life. And, you know, for me, finding them now, it's a godsend. Uh, at a time when I miss him, at a time when the kids want to really feel that their grandfather is still very much a part of their lives, he is. He just sent a message. Oh, so, you know, this, this is it. I mean, I am so passionate about this stuff. As you mentioned, I do this for a living as well to help other people capture their stories. But I really do feel that our stories are what make us human, what make us relatable, what start friendships, what can... Uh, help us get through this incredibly isolating time in our lives. Well, I want to tell everybody listening, so moving, um, in just a few minutes, we're going to have questions. So post your questions on the Q&A um, function of this webinar, and we'll look for them because we would love to hear those. Um, I guess you mentioned some of start now. <laughs> Now's the time. Don't wait another minute. And I guess to kind of get people jump started in this uh, way, you have a call to action I do. this month. Tell us about that. I do. I do. So I, I'm hoping that this book is is part of that call to action. You know, it's a it's a collection of our stories and the stories of many, many people, just heartfelt personal stories. And I hope that it will help stir a storytelling uh, practice in, in many of you. And to encourage that, at the back of the book, 
I don't know if you can see, but uh, there are postcards of some of the beautiful art by Sokra that's in, in this book. And the idea to include these postcards is to encourage people to just jot down something that they would like to remember, uh, their story, a wisdom, a gratitude, uh, whatever it may be, and just keep it uh, as, as a memory of, of your story or share something about yourself uh, and, and make a new friend, somebody that you'd like to get to know better. Just send this to them with, with some aspect of your story. So the call to action, what I would love to see is every week this month, if each of us could uh, jot down a story, again, doesn't have to be a whole long essay, just a few words, even bullet points, even a sketch if you like to draw, uh, or even a phone call. Call a, a parent or an elder or a friend, a family member, whoever, and reminisce about something that's important in, in both of your lives. So, you know, start recollecting and start remembering and start collecting and hopefully start uh, writing down and sharing. And if you're inclined, uh, share it with me too. Um, I'll ask uh, Lily to put my email in the chat. Uh, take a picture of your story and your postcard and send it to me or, or uh, share a story with me. I would love to get to know you better. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to um, first, while we're waiting uh, for questions, please don't be shy. Um, I'll read this incredible comment that just came in. First, there, you've had all manner of congratulations. You've probably seen in the chat um, that you're gorgeous. The book is gorgeous. It's what the world needs right now. Um, there is information in the chat function about where you can get the book, because that was one question. How do I buy the book in the UK? Yes. So the book is only available um, through my website. And I think my website's in the chat. It's salmahasanali.com. Uh, and I can uh, certainly send it to the UK and I'm having a few copies um, sent to London so that um, I, I'll be able to get it to folks internationally from, from there as well. Um, I, I, it's just been available for two days. I have been so overwhelmed with uh, people's reaction and with um, how many people are buying it. So I just want to say thank you to everybody who is supporting this project. It's um, yeah, it's it, it's very meaningful for me. It's been a labor of, of love and on so many people's parts. Um, so thank you for that. I Well, here's a question in the chat function. Beautiful book and project from Amina and Faraz. Are there moments when you know an experience is a story, but you hesitate to write it down as a story? You know, for me, a moment is a story. Uh, I think it's it's just how we sort of define story. A story is a moment. Um, don't, don't think of story as in beginning, middle, end, you know, the way we are taught in school. It doesn't need to be um, organized. It, it doesn't need to be, you don't need to write it in a particular way. Um, don't worry about the grammar. Don't worry about your words. Just really jot down whatever moment is, has meaning for you. That is a story, that is your story. And it's valid and it's beautiful and you will treasure it a year from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, your, your kids will value knowing that that moment was meaningful to you. Yeah. In, do, do you think there are moments when um, you know something's a story, but you think, I mean, it may be that it might be for it seemed too painful, hard, difficult to write something down as a story as well, right? Yes, that yes, yes. And, you know, it shouldn't be forced. Um, take your time. There might not be, uh, there have been times, there have been stories uh, that I haven't been able to write. Um, and I, I even say that in the book, there was one year which was the hardest year of my life. And I was writing the blog and I couldn't share a lot of the things that I was going through. It just was too painful. It was too close. It was, uh, I wasn't ready. And that's okay. You know, the, you don't need to reveal things that you're not ready to reveal. But when you might be, know that writing it down or even sharing it is, is a very, it's part of the healing process. Uh, you know, as you were saying, Claire, 
there's so much science behind stories, writing them, sharing them, hearing them, uh, all sorts of cortisol and oxytocin and all these hormones get, um, get, get sparked. And so there is, there is that as well. It is part of healing and part of nurturing ourselves. So uh, there's, there's no rush. In that this is an, a, a question, I didn't even see this one, but this relates to exactly what we we're talking about. What do we do with the sad or dark chapters in our story? Is it okay to rewrite our stories and reinvent ourselves as the characters of our story? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, your story is your own to define it as you wish, to redefine it when you need to. There's such a beautiful quote. I, I wish I could remember it now, but if, if you're interested, I, I'm not sure who's asking this, but on my Instagram, uh, I share quotes about storytelling and I shared one recently that speaks exactly to this. Um, and yes, I mean, our stories, you can embellish them a little bit if you want. There's, there's no right or wrong way. You can, um, you know, it's how you experience it. It's how you feel it. It doesn't need to be uh, factual in that sense. It's, it's your story, you know, please write it as it fits and change it as, as you need to and feel comfortable with it. There is no box uh, and no rules uh, that you need to follow. That's an incredible suggestion. Um, Mirna uh, asks, says, I keep a diary, but never think that what I write is worthy of being called a story. Of course, that's what we all think. And, I, and um, at, we want all of our stories to look like your book. And so that's a high bar. But how do you differentiate between writing your thoughts and events mm -hmm. versus a story? Do you well, I guess I, I would add to that, Salma, do you sometimes just jot things down knowing you want to come back to it later? And then do you think about, oh, in order to make this into a story, I want to rearrange it a little bit? Or does it all just flow out in, in a natural story form? For you? Uh, no, it doesn't flow out. It takes a lot of... Um a lot of time and a lot of thought and I guess, you know, a lot of practice as with anything else. Um, and I, I can't remember what you asked initially. I messed it up. The, the, the Hernandez's question was, she writes a lot in her diary, but she doesn't feel like it's worthy of being called a story. How do you differentiate between mm -hmm. your thoughts that you might put in a diary and then mm -hmm become a story. Right. Well, I, I mean, it depends. If, if you want to turn your thoughts into a story for some purpose or f to share or to publish, then yes, then it needs uh, a, a little more finesse. Um, but your thoughts and your reflections and whatever you write in a diary, if it's just for you and for your family, that's that's your story. Uh, if, you know, if, you, if you'd like to polish it, there is a process to, to do that. And I'll just share, for example, um, I, I had wanted to write the story of how my family came to this country from Pakistan. I had no intention of publishing it. Uh, I just wanted to record that chapter of our history. And even though I'm a writer, I hadn't done it for so many years. And, and this is one suggestion. Um, I, I actually took a writing class at the Bethesda Writer Center so that I would have a homework assignment and some sense of accountability and some discipline and a deadline. And then I sat my parents down, I interviewed them, I looked through old family pictures and I wrote that story of the moment that we left Pakistan and arrived in America. And I learned so much about my parents and myself and our life. Uh, and I wrote it as this assignment for class and I tucked it away. And so, you know, it became the thoughts into a story uh, and then just, you know, kept it for my kids. I read it to them. I read it to my parents. And then a friend of mine read it. Uh, Rebecca might be on here as well. And she said, it's interesting. Send it to the Washingtonian. I'm like, why in the world would they be interested in this ordinary story of this ordinary family who comes to America? But I figured I have nothing to lose. I've written it. I've got 2,000 words. I'll, uh, you know, send it to this editor that... Um, that I knew there and I pressed send. Uh, and a few days later, got a call from the Washingtonian that they wanted to talk to me about this story. And it ended up being published. 
Uh, and so that's, you know, that's one example where it was just thoughts initially, hearing my father and my mother and uh, share their story, wrote it down with a little bit more structure uh, and discipline, and then ended up having it published. So um, yeah, there's, there are many, many ways in which this can be done. Well, and this ties in the next um, comment from Gail, which says stories are essential now for several reasons. We're a young country without a developed national culture, true. Technology makes us more divided and lonelier than ever. We have a lot of artificial online friends. When we're young, we roll our eyes every time an elder tells the same story a thousand times. She's been around my children. Uh, <laughs> Second, the elder is no longer on earth. We're devastated and crave hearing the same story just one more time. I encourage everyone to videotape their elders telling their stories before it's too late. Their stories can be passed down through the generations and provide future generations with a sense of their family history. Also, hearing other people's universal stories remind us we may originate from different places, but we're also similar. And I I agree, and I've seen there are lots of services now, in addition to hiring Selma to help with storytelling, but I've just seen online apps where you can use those with the questions and the, everything to just record your parents, right? And here are the 10 questions to ask and it, it makes it easier than this sort of open-ended. Right. And Claire, did you say that uh, comment was from Gail? Gail, yeah. Okay, so let me tell you about Gail and stories. Uh, I was just sharing um, this story that ended up in the Washingtonian, okay? This woman named Gail, who I didn't know, she read that story. She, I think they'd included my email at the end of that story. And she emailed me and she said, we've never met. You don't know who I am, but I just read your story and I feel like we're friends <laughs> and I'd like to be your friend. And, and that's how it started. This was about, uh, the story came out 12 years ago. So probably 12 years ago, she just, she just wrote to me and, and said, you know, that story was warm and inviting and it just made me want to learn more about you and to, um, to reach out to you. And so we went out to dinner and she has become one of my dearest, closest, most incredible friends and the most loyal follower of the 30 Days blog from day one. In fact, shout out to Gail because uh, she just came the other day to pick up several copies of the book and she has been spreading news about the book and she predicted this book even before I even dreamt that it could be possible. Uh, right from after the first year of the blog, she said, you know, and wait a couple more years, but then publish a book and make sure every school has it and every library has it and every interfaith group has it. And, Every house of worship has it. And, and I said, Gail, what are you talking about? This is just a blog for my family. And here we are, Gail. This this worked. This is ours. <laughs> you know, before I, I, there's another question about the artistic decisions in the book, which is, I really want to hear about that because that video was so beautiful. But I want to say that Annette Tracy posted, and I'm not sure if everybody saw it. Salma, thank you so much for sharing how I reached out to you as a Catholic mom with a daughter who was converting to Islam 10 years ago, you just brought tears to my eyes. Thinking yeah. back, I had so many fears, but now I embrace and accept my daughter's conversion as I continue to practice my own Catholic faith. You've been such an instrumental part of our life. My forever friend, Salma. Ramadan Mubarak, God bless you. Always inshallah, Annette. Oh, thank That's you, Annette. Thank That's you, I love you. I'm so glad she's tuned in. Um, well, wait, okay, so there's artistic, before we get to the art, maybe we'll wrap up with the art, but this is a really important point, I think, Salma, mm -hmm. from Zeshan. In an age where Instagram refers to a story as a 15 second bit of content, what will the role of stories be in the years to come? Will they need to be shorter? Or will we as a society just become more thirsty for longer, more nuanced stories? You have a crystal ball. <laughs> uh, I don't, you know, I. I I think be true to yourself, be true to your words, be true to how you want to express yourself. I, I don't follow any, any rules. Um, you know, I'm not on TikTok doing the short things or and it, Instagram, my posts are really long and I hardly have any followers because I write so much, but you know, to each their own and whoever reads it, reads it. Uh, I'm not worried about 
getting a huge following on, on social media. I just want to express myself in as many words as I need. And I'll give you one example, Sishan. Thank you for being here. Um, Humans of New York. I mean, talk about storytelling. That platform is phenomenal. And I remember Brandon Stanton, the guy who started it, saying that, you know, people were telling him initially that keep it to this length and your stories are way too long and nobody's going to read them on social media, especially on Instagram. I mean, he has 15 part stories and millions of people are glued to them, including myself. I love his stories and they are exactly what we're talking about. The, the ordinary, vulnerable, you know, sensitive, genuine, messy stories that we all live and people are drawn to them however long they are. If you tell them with honesty and with a sense of sincerity and with a real genuine willingness to open up and share, people will read. I mean, that's been my experience. And uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm not into following story rules. Just be true to yourself and true to your story. Yeah, authenticity matters. And I think there is a hunger for good content, always. Yes. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about your artistic decisions, the artwork and this book making? Yes, happily, happily. This, uh, this was one of the, the most beautiful things to come out of this pandemic for me. Um, I was connected to a, a woman named Sohra by a friend of mine. At the time, uh, she was just you know, looking for a place to, to live. Um, she was looking for some work. And through my networks, this friend thought, you know, perhaps I could, I could help. And I was happy to, to try and assist in that way. But as I got to know Sohra and learn about her art, I realized that she is this extraordinary artist. She had been invited uh, by the Smithsonian, by the Freer and Sackler Gallery, to come and exhibit her art. She does miniature paintings and illuminations and calligraphy. And about four years ago, and I think Sokra is watching too, um, in 2016, she had this exhibit with a few other artists from Kabul. It was called Turquoise Mountain. Um, beautiful. I remember seeing it then. I, I, who knew that I would meet Sokra a few years later? And the exhibit was, was so popular and her art was so well appreciated, so much so that it was difficult for her to go back to Kabul. Her life was uh, threatened if, if she were to go back. And so since 2017, she has been in this country. Um, and when I, when, when I was connected with her and I learned more about her and we met and we talked and it just, it just clicked that the 30 days, the themes and the ideas and the ethos and the values of this blog fits so beautifully with the traditional and beautiful and artistic and vibrant art that Sohra creates. And that one way that hopefully I can support her and encourage her and share her art more widely is through this collaboration. And so we met just a few months ago and started working on this book just at the beginning of this year. And so she designed the cover, which is uh, an original design. And, you know, her artwork is so detailed and um, takes so much time. We didn't have enough time for, uh, for her to do original uh, pieces just for this book. All of the pieces she's originally done, but over months and months. And it's, it's such a um, honor to have them grace the pages. I think they fit so beautifully with the stories. So Sohra, thank you for sharing your art um, with us. That's so beautiful. Well, we have um, time for these two. I just saw a second one, final questions. One is, um, let's see. Well, and I don't wanna say the last question was from Peg. Uh, this one is anonymous. The dedication of the book is so beautiful to the children of your family and your parents. Can you elaborate on the dedications? With so much pleasure, I'll just read the words. So the dedication is to all the young people in our family, may you always cherish where you come from. And to my dearest parents for teaching me why it matters. So this, this book really is for my nieces and my nephews, certainly for my kids, um, for, for all the young people, for them to have a sense of their history 
their uh, or legacy, to feel connected to a family and a foundation that is strong, for them to know that they are loved and cherished and that we are always here for them and that we, you know, this is a grounding, a rooting for them um, so that they feel confident in themselves, in their identities, in their background, in their history, in their tradition, in their culture. But at the same time, they feel confident to write their own stories, to take what's meaningful for them from what we've shared and blend it with things that are important to them. You know, it's like two colors that mix and form a, a whole new hue. It's, that's what it's about. It's not about, okay, this is how it, it was done and this is how it needs to be done. You know, there's, there, there are so many ways that um, we can adapt our traditions to make sense in the culture that they're growing up with, but just for them to know that there is tradition and there's history and there's, uh, there's family and to feel proud of that. And it's my parents who, who taught me that, you know, I was born in Pakistan, but I've lived in this country uh, since I was seven. So um, a long time, but those, what my parents, you know, the, the things that are important in our culture, the hospitality, the generosity of spirit, the respect for our elders, I, those are the most important things for me. And I hope we've been able to share that with our kids and I hope they'll share that with theirs. And this is just a keepsake for them and, and really for all our kids. Because again, as I mentioned before, while this, this blog took place during Ramadan and the characters happen to be Muslim, these are values that Claire, we've talked about this. We cherish this for our families. We want them to feel, we want our kids to feel rooted and, and strong and confident. Uh, and so this is a book for all our children, you know, to, to just get a sense of that. Thank you, Salma. Finally, um, from Isabel. Congratulations, my dear friend Salma. I remember when we used to take afternoon strolls on the Brookstone Court, talking and sharing about our families a few years ago. Little did I know that your wonderful blog will culminate into this book. I'm inspired. I've been writing a story about me and my son who has a developmental disability. I've struggled with consistency. Sometimes I'm not sure whether I'm describing a single event or writing a story. I hope to gain some inspiration from your book. What advice can you give to someone who's getting started in storytelling and writing? Isabel, my dear Isabel, I'm so glad you're here. The only advice that I can give is to keep going, to just um, trust yourself, trust your voice, trust what you want to say about your yourself and your son and what you're going through, and just keep going. I think that's that's the biggest advice. Don't, you know, I mean, there'll be times when you, the words just won't come out, and that happens with me every single day put it away for that day and come back the next day, but really trust yourself and just keep writing and keep keep pouring it out. It is so uh, important and it's so good for our health and it's um, healing and hopeful. And, and I'm here, call me anytime when, when I can provide some inspiration. And I'm sure there are moments where it's just, there's frustration and it's unclear and you sort of work your way through that. Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. There are many blank screens and many blank pages and many uh, tears and frustrations and you just, it's part of the process. You just, you just have to get through it. There is, uh, for none of, I don't think for any of us, I, I'm sure Claire for you too, a seasoned journalist there, there, there are so many uh, blocks and you just keep, keep at it. Just, just to let it stop. Uh, Sukra also said thank you for talking about me and my artwork so kindly. Uh, beautiful, my dear Sama. Uh, so happy for our collaboration. You've had so many thank yous and so much praise on the chat, Sama. It's incredible. You wouldn't be able to talk if you were reading all of that, but thank you for this. this oh my goodness, thank you. Inspiring conversation. Thank you for bringing this book into the world for all of us. Thank you. It's, uh, it's been a labor of love. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, and, and thank you, Claire, so much. This was so special to do this with you. Thank you for taking the time and for, for just honoring this book in this way and our conversation. And 
thank you to everyone who's watching and listening and I hope I hope you'll be encouraged to to share your stories too and share them with me I would love to hear them and and this is this is a limited edition so I've already told Soma I don't think you're having enough made so <laughs> order soon everybody it's yes. beautiful but it will it will sell out <laughs> thank you everyone thanks everyone